Nowadays, finding an affordable 4 to 16 power first focal plane scope isn't all that uncommon. But what is uncommon is a 4 to 16 power first focal plane scope that's less than 10 and a half inches long. This is the Sniper VT, and we're going to take a look at it on this episode of Moondog Industries. Alright, this is the Sniper VT4 to 16x44 first focal plane scope. So this is unusual. And uh, this is a fairly small box because it is a very small scope. It is just a hair over 10 inches long. And this makes it well, I chose this because it is the shortest first focal plane 4 to 16 scope I could find. Uh, if you know of a shorter one, please let me know. Uh, oh, but uh, what you get in the box, just do a quick unboxing here. Um, you get a uh, microfiber cleaning cloth. Uh, you do get a owner's manual about the VT. You get uh, an Allen wrench and you get a set of a CR1620 batteries uh, for the illumination. And that's pretty much it. Well, that's not all. You do get a mount. You get an offset cantilever mount that the scope is pre-mounted on. It's an odd design that's a very square looking mount, but it is skeletonized to lighten the weight and on close inspection seems to be well made. What I don't like is that the tightening screws are on the right side, which gets in the way of levers and charging handles. I ended up having to unscrew and remove the scope and remount it at 180 degrees to solve that issue. Anyway, let's take a look at this scope. and. Overall, it is it is nicely constructed. Um, I'm not so fond, though, of the choice of the gold paint uh, on the numbers here. And I, I saw that on the photos online. And I thought, eh, maybe it'll look better when I get it, when I actually get it in hand. And nope, it does not. I am not fond of this. It reminds me of sort of luxury watches from um, the early 1980s the black and gold. Uh, aesthetics aside, the paint it just fills in a lot of the numbers, the etched numbers, and makes them hard to read. So just not just the fact that I don't really like the, the color scheme, it's just not, it's not conducive uh, from a performance standpoint when you can't read the numbers very easily. Anyway, I think it, they would have been better served with maybe just flat white paint or just better etching. Anyway, um, the Parallax side focus turns smoothly with a little stiff, but then again, it's at a new scope. It has a it has a good uh, knurling there for for traction. Uh, this is the illuminator, and it is an uh, an analog style, so it just turns. Uh, there are no settings, just on and brighter, basically. And has it turn and uh, it's gold. I mean, gold, uh, green or red. Uh, those are the two settings on that. The turrets are pop lock turrets. They they're locking, and you pull them up, and they are quite loud. You can hear them, but they aren't. They aren't very tactile positive. You can hear them more than you can feel them. And I don't know if you can see here, there is a bit of slop, a fair bit of slop before it engages in, into the next click. So that's a little disappointing. They are quarter MOA per click and it is, the turrets are resettable. You just use the Allen wrench that comes with it, unscrew that, pop off the cap and set your zero. So that's good. Let's try the windage. A little more positive, but again, still not very tactile positive, but loud, plenty loud, that's for sure. So yeah, again, it would have been nice if it wasn't that gold color, if the etching was a little more precise. This just looks a little sloppy. All right, so magnification wheel turns smoothly. Oh, wait. Well, a little, a little rough in that one patch, and it's more, I could hear it more than I could feel it. So it doesn't feel gritty in any way. I just could hear a little bit more rubbing than I'd like. And it would have been nice if they would have included a little nub, like on some of their other scopes, uh, that would function kind of like a throw lever. This one is just 
um, purely same height all the way around. Still decent knurling. Our ocular or European style fast focus. Stiff, but fairly smooth. Again, I can hear, I can hear rubbing more than I can feel any, any uh, grittiness, so that's not bad. Let's take it out to the range and see how well it performs. But first, let's start with some extreme long distance. We're looking at the peak of Mount Davidson, approximately 1,300 yards away, through the Sniper VT 4 to 16 variable power scope. And we're looking at it at its lowest power setting of 4, which is what we always do to, to gauge uh, a, a optics uh, best image performance because uh, at its lowest power setting we're going to see its maximum image clarity, contrast, detail, color saturation, etc. And we can compare the image that we're getting inside of the, uh, the optic versus the outside world in terms of light throughput. We can look at the sky in terms of how it's gotten darker slightly and also the color of the foliage here versus what we're seeing through the scope. Uh, it's gotten a little bit warmer, but eh, not bad overall, and we have uh, pretty good contrast. Now, as you magnify any variable power scope, you're gonna introduce more color distortions and uh, darkening of the image, so um, this is the best way to gauge it at its lowest power setting. But with that in mind, let's zoom in to its maximum setting of 16. The uh, point of aim hasn't shifted, so that's good and we didn't lose anything in terms of uh, the eye relief or at least not that I can notice what you're not seeing in this video is that the eye box got significantly narrower it's a bit unforgiving but that's to be expected with any budget scope we lost a bit of contrast but you know that's that's to be expected and um, we can make out a steel trail marker sign at the top of the hill there, just to the right of the center reticle. That is about a 30, 36 inch diameter uh, sign, and that's a good proxy for a steel target at this distance. The scope has built-in illumination, which is visible in the shade in daylight. You can choose to illuminate the central cruciform in either green or red. So for the next tests, we're at the range. I put up my reference targets and we're going to walk down to 100 yards and while we do that, please take a moment and hit the like and subscribe buttons. It just takes a second, it's absolutely free, and it's good for you because you're overriding Big Tech's algorithm. You know they like to suppress a lot of firearms and 2A videos, that's why you never see them suggested on your feed. By hitting like and subscribe, you're taking control of the algorithm. And if you like to watch things other than guns and ammo, well I got you covered there too. Check out my other channel, Moondog R&D a channel focused on gadgets, travel, and other geeky stuff. All right, we're looking at uh, reference targets 100 yards downrange, and we're going to just measure the range, see the range of adjustments on these turrets here. And I'm gonna bring the elevation down. Notice that the reticle has stopped moving even though the turret hasn't bottomed out. And that's the bottom. And in the other direction, I have to twist the turret a few times to get the reticle to start moving again. Well, despite the turret not precisely locking in with a reticle at the bottom there, it does appear to have a pretty good range of elevation adjustment. And that's the top. A similar thing happens with the windage. The reticle stops moving to the left well before the turret right, hits a wall. Let's look at the windage. The reticle has stopped moving. Alright, that's as far left as it'll go. And it takes quite a few winds before the reticle starts moving again in the opposite direction. It seems to bottom out before the turret stopped because it doesn't seem like it turned that much once it got to the extremes. Okay, there's the right mouse. Let's bring that back to center. I've digitally enlarged the view so we can more clearly see the target. Let's see if the point of aim changes from high magnification to low and back up to high magnification. That's right on, so it passes. 
We're looking at an MOA calibrated target down range. Each grid square is one MOA. And each turret click on this scope supposedly is one quarter MOA. So as I count out 16 turret clicks, that should move the reticle exactly four squares over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then up. 16, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, this is a little disappointing. It appears to be one MOA square too low. We're going to do Cyclops Joe's famous nipple twister test and see if the reticle will return to this position after turning the turrets like crazy. See if it'll return. Oops, all right, back to zero. Oops, also turn that one the wrong way. Hey, and we're back to zero. Well, so, on yeah, re-examining the footage, the it's close, but not exactly where it started. All right, let's take a look at the still image of the video so that we don't have to deal with any uh, heat shimmer. The image could be brighter, but I'm not seeing any chromatic aberration, just the barest hints of it at the edges of the white target frame, so this is really good, especially at max magnification. Now the image is not tack sharp from center to edge, it does get softer around the outer edges of your field of view, but this is pretty common with budget scopes. Let's take a look at the bullseye target at the bottom there. I can barely make out a 22 bullet hole below the black bullseye and one just faintly at the bottom edge of the paper, uh, but I can't make out any of the holes inside the black of the bullseye. Uh, on the US Air Force's optical resolution chart directly above the bullseye target, I can make out both vertical and horizontal lines down to element three in group negative two on the left there. All right, I think we have a pretty good sense of the strengths and weaknesses of this scope now, but before I get into it, I'd just like to remind you to again, hit the like and subscribe buttons. Now let's start with the optics and reticle first. We're looking at this at 100 yards and this is a first focal plane scope, so the reticle does get larger. I like the overall design of this reticle, but it's just too thick. The center dot is too big to do precision rimfire shooting at this distance, but well within minute of squirrel if uh, you know hunting is what you're using the scope for. In terms of clarity, resolution, and detail, even at 16 power, you'd be really challenged to spot your holes at this distance. Now, if you had a higher power scope or a higher end scope, like, like a 500 or a $1,000 scope, yeah, you could make out those holes, but this scope is under $200. And now to the turrets. Where do I start? Well, it doesn't track true. The turrets are neither precise or repeatable, and the reticle sticks at the extreme ends of its adjustment. This would make the scope a hard pass for any long distance precision shooter who has to change or dial in a correct dope. Now, the scope could be perfectly fine for a typical shooter or hunter who just needs a scope that keeps it zero. Well, this scope could work for you. And it has held at zero on my Ruger 1022 over the course of 200 rounds of testing. Granted, it is just a 22. Now, getting back to what I said at the very beginning of this video, what makes this scope different is that it is very short for a first focal plane 16 power scope. Now, I could put a standard sized high power scope on this 1022 takedown, but that kind of misses the point. The reason you'd buy a takedown or any other small rifle is you want a compact size or lightweight for backpacking, off road biking, or kayaking to your hunting spot. Now, prior to this, the only scope that would fit in my Ruger backpacking bag was a UTG Bugbuster, which is only a 3 to 9 power scope. Now the VT is 4 to 16 power and it's about an inch and a half longer, but will it fit on the 1022 in the bag? Yes. It will. So there you go, the Sniper VT, a very compact first focal plane scope. And if there is a more compact or a higher magnification scope in this size, please let me know because I haven't found it. 
If you're interested in picking one up, I've included product links on my full written review on my blog, moondogindustries.com, so check that out. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Thanks again for watching. Moondog, out. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, please share it on forums, Facebook, Reddit, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, MeWe, whatever social media you're on. And if you want to see all of my videos, check out MoondogIndustries.com.